today's episode on the Dive Saga channel, we are going to talk about technical diving. We're going to talk about what it is, what the dangers are, what the advantages are, a little bit about decompression theory and how to become a technical diver. Well, hello guys and welcome back to another episode on the Dive Saga channel. Today we're going to talk about technical diving. I'm a technical diver and I'm a Trimix instructor trainer. Uh, I really enjoy technical diving but Technical diving is definitely not for everyone. You may be watching this video out of general interest and that's great, I'm super grateful for that. If you like this type of content, maybe leave a like, a comment, ask a question uh, and definitely consider subscribing to the Saga channel. Now, what is technical diving? The definitions vary a little bit because different training agencies have different entry points into technical diving. There are some training agencies that consider decompression diving recreational diving and then there are other training agencies who consider recreational diving to be only non-stop diving. That's the assumption that we're going to operate on in this video. And what do I mean when I say non-stop diving? Essentially a dive that you can conduct and at any point in the dive you can safely go to the surface. Most training agencies will agree that for entry level courses and even for more advanced level training non-stop diving is the norm. Most dive computers are designed in such a way that the assumption is made that we do non-stop diving. So once again, re regardless of the depth we go to, as long as we stay within those limits, at any point we can abort the dive and go straight to the surface in a controlled manner, maybe make a safety stop and then exit. And even a safety stop is just that. It's a safety stop. It's there for your safety. It's a very good idea to do it. However, if you would omit the safety stop, you are not necessarily in trouble. In a very basic way, decompression theory is such that the deeper we go, the more gas absorbs into our body at a faster pace. And so the result is that as far as non-stop diving is concerned, the deeper we go, the shorter time we are allotted to spend at that depth. It depends a little bit which algorithm, which training agency, which chart, which computer you stick to. They're all based on research, of course, but for the sake of simplicity, let's say that at uh, 30 meters, 100 feet, you can spend about 20 minutes or so. Beyond 30 meters, it gets a little tricky. If we go to 40 meters or 135 feet, we're down to about 9, 10, 11 minutes, depending on which algorithm you follow. So we are slowly putting ourselves into a scenario where spending any significant amount of time while still being able to make a direct surface is actually impossible. And that's where technical diving comes in. When we talk about technical diving, most people think about deeper diving. But it is important to point out that technical diving is deeper diving but can also be longer dives at a recreational depth. It is perfectly possible to go to 30 meters 100 feet but for a very long period of time and therefore no longer being able to make that direct access to the surface, right? And then there is of course also just more complex overhead diving. Anytime that direct vertical access to the surface isn't possible because of an overhead obstruction like a complicated shipwreck, cavern, cave or ice, those could be considered and sometimes are considered technical dives as well. Technical diving is not simply going into deco. Simply go diving outside of the limits of your tables, diving outside of the limit of a dive computer or even following a dive computer into a decompression profile isn't decompression diving. The philosophy behind proper decompression diving and behind proper technical diving is in the preparation. It can be very complicated to prepare for a technical dive because when we commit to a stop dive, a decompression dive, in other words, direct vertical access to the surface is no longer there, we need to make sure that we can 
commit to these stops. We need to make sure we can execute them to perfection. And that is where the real difference lies between simply going into deco, following your computer to places you shouldn't be versus planning and executing a technical dive. Now, what guarantees that we will be able to make these decompression stops? First of all, nothing. Nothing guarantees you'll be able to make these stops. So it is very important to accept the risk. The risk of technical diving is simply greater than the risk of no stop diving. And that is a perfect argument to not tech dive. Once you've accepted the risks, the next thing that guarantees to an extent that you'll be able to make these stops is redundancy. With redundancy, we mean basically at least two of everything. In terms of our gas supply, we ensure redundancy by either carrying doubles with an isolator manifold or perhaps a side mount system, but two independent gas sources so that if one gets compromised, we can still use the other gas source to make it safely through our decompression. Two computers, so that if one computer dies or gets compromised, we still have a backup. Some people work around that by having a slate with the decompression schedule written down. That works as well, assuming you execute that schedule exactly the way it's prepared. Two masks, at least two cutting devices, two signaling devices, two ways of maintaining your buoyancy, and definitely also two brains, meaning you and your buddy. Redundancy is probably the single most important element to surviving a tech dive in case things go wrong. And that also explains why simply going into decompression without all this equipment does not constitute technical diving. The redundancy simply isn't there. If you commit to a decompression dive and have an equipment malfunction, there may be no way to actually commit and execute to the decompression that's now required. The second element that makes up technical diving is in the preparation. It is very unlikely that you will be able to simply put on your equipment, jump in the water and execute a dive. Generally speaking, you should never do that. Not for decompression diving, but also not for no stop diving. You should always have a plan that you discuss with your buddy and with someone who remains on the surface before you execute the dive. But it is much more common in recreational diving, especially since the advent of computers, to simply follow your dive computer and that is your plan that is being generated on the fly. So long as you check your submersible pressure gauge, you stick to your buddy and you have decent navigational skills, you are in the safe zone when you do that. With technical diving, that is simply not an option. There is a wide variety of factors that need to be considered when performing a technical dive because there are some inherent dangers. The most immediate danger is decompression sickness. This danger already exists in recreational diving, but by its very nature, during most technical dives, we go into decompression, meaning more inert gas is dissolving into our tissues than what can safely off gas on a slow ascent. We have to stage stops on our way up to let the gas escape our tissues, or we even have to use other gas mixtures to help accelerate this off-gassing process. It is probably the easiest danger to understand that if we spend time beyond our no deco limit, and then due to circumstances beyond our control, have an uncontrolled ascent and go directly to the surface, we are almost certain to get decompression sickness. This will manifest itself to pain, numbness, a sensation of fatigue, a variety of skin uh, marks, soreness, um, but it can absolutely result in uh, death. So decompression sickness is something to watch out for. That is why we use decompression theory and decompression plans to make what we call decompression stops. The second danger to technical diving is CNS oxygen toxicity or central nervous system O2 toxicity. If you are already an enriched air diver, a nitrox diver, then you may be familiar with this concept. See, oxygen in the air that we breathe has toxic properties, but Right here at the surface, we don't experience those because 21% of oxygen at one bar, one ATA of ambient pressure has no relevant effect on our body. 
once we start compressing this gas and therefore increasing the partial pressure of this gas even though the percentage remains the same the effects on our body become much more noticeable Unfortunately, many technical divers need to use enriched air gases for the decompression phase of the dive. Enriched air gases, or sometimes pure oxygen, actually helps eliminating the nitrogen faster. So we can decrease the decompression time by breathing a gas that is higher in oxygen content. Wherein lies the danger? These gases have a maximum operational depth that is much shallower than the gas we're breathing at the bottom of our tech dive. Because during a tech dive, we often have to make gas switches so that we are often using the most optimal decompression gas. During those gas switches is the exact point where the danger lies. Because accidentally switching to the wrong gas, in other words, switching to a gas that has a uh, oxygen percentage that is not suitable for that depth can result in O2 toxicity. This can lead to immediate convulsions and almost immediate drowning. It is probably the more scary danger of tech diving, more so in my opinion than decompression sickness. Decompression sickness happens with a delayed effect at the surface typically later. Oxygen toxicity happens often immediately after the mistake and since we are in the water there are very few options to have an immediate solution to this potential disaster. Another danger to technical diving is simply gas narcosis and poor judgment. We already learn about this as recreational divers. When we breathe nitrogen, we and to an extent oxygen as well by the way, we do get uh, a little bit of a, a sleepy, confused, drunk, intoxicated feeling the deeper we go. For some people this narcosis effect happens relatively shallow, maybe 20 meters and onwards, for others it is more at 30 meters, 100 feet, or even deeper. Now, on technical dives, uh, down to about, I would say, 50 meters, 165 feet is where most people put their limit of how deep they will dive on air. Because the narcotic effect simply becomes a little bit too high in risk and we cannot tolerate that risk because technical diving is complex and so getting confused, getting a sensation of drunkenness, getting narcosis while we are doing these complex uh, dives is obviously not desirable. We mitigate this risk by introducing a non-narcotic gas, which is helium. And that's where trimix diving comes into play. So uh, that's why a lot of people, as soon as they dive deeper than, let's say, 40 meters, 165 feet, they will actually not only reduce the oxygen content to avoid oxygen toxicity, but they will also reduce the nitrogen content and replace that void, fill that void with helium, which has a non-narcotic effect. Another risk to technical diving to an extent is hypoxia because air no longer functions beyond certain depths and we start using trimix, we actually have to reduce the oxygen content in the gas. Now, due to Dalton's law of partial pressures, those gases with low oxygen contents will absolutely still fulfill uh, their function when we're at depth, but they may not do so when we are at the surface. So it is dangerous to use a low oxygen content gas in a low ambient atmosphere. Therefore, it's very important to have a travel gas on the way down. And then a last risk is isobaric counter diffusion. Now we're getting really technical and you could almost lump this together with decompression sickness. But basically, as soon as we introduce helium trimix into the mix, we start working with different inert gases, nitrogen and helium. Now they diffuse at different rates, which means that if we accidentally mix those gases, we switch from them one after the other, you might actually end up with a higher gas concentration in your body than you were planning to have, again higher than your decompression schedule was planning to off-gas and you might get a form of decompression sickness. So that is a concern specific to trimix diving and a very real thing that we need to consider when we do our gas planning and our gas switches. Now, technical diving isn't all just about danger. Yes, these dangers are very real and they are important to acknowledge and to accept and to train against. But there are reasons why we conduct technical dives. First of all, it definitely fulfills the human drive for exploration. 
See, scuba diving has become very prevalent since the 70s, 80s, 90s, but very few people actually venture below 30, 40 meters, 100, 130 feet. And they shouldn't. There are some very real dangers that we just discussed. But for those who have a real drive to really explore, to discover, to find places that haven't been visited before, technical diving is an instrument to access those type of dives. As I already said, this is something you have to train for, not something you just do because you feel like you are an explorer. You may also like technical diving because you enjoy science. I mentioned Dalton's law of partial pressures earlier. It is quite incredible that on dives to, for instance, a hundred meters, 330 feet, we use only 12% oxygen in our gas mixture. By all accounts on the surface, 12% oxygen is nowhere near enough to even sustain consciousness or life. But due to Dalton's law of partial pressures, when we expose that gas to 11 bars of pressure and we breathe that gas, it more than fulfills our oxygen needs. The fact that that works blows my mind on every single dive. I know the science, I know how to calculate it, I know it will work, but still every time it works, I find it magical. It is really a way to take science, put it into practice, and uh, another reason that I personally like technical diving is the discipline. As I mentioned earlier, diving, technical diving without a plan, without the preparation is actually a suicide mission. And I enjoy the opposite of that. I very much enjoy stacking the deck against uh, those dangers. I enjoy getting with my team, getting with my, 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 my teammates and running a decompression profile on our laptop, running the, the, the gas requirements against each other's uh, gas consumption rates, blending the gas, filling the cylinders, labeling them, talking through the plan, checking our equipment, making sure everything is functional. And there is something really bonding that happens when you and your mates go on a dive and execute that dive exactly the way you planned it. Um, it's a great way to experience your own proficiency with diving. And it's also a nice bonding experience with people who are at that same level. It definitely scratches an itch that is, um, yeah, like I said, somewhere in the discipline side of your brain. So if you enjoy that, 100%. So if you do not enjoy discipline, probably not for you. And slowly leaning into that, another huge advantage of technical diving, in my opinion, is that it greatly enhances your ability to be a team player. Now, there are different schools of thought within technical diving. Some people insist on, I am me, I dive my plan and I take care of myself. Another school of thought is that I can take care of myself, but I will be there for my buddy to the extent that I am willing to be there. And it is very important within a team to discuss how much risk you're willing to take for each other, if any. But having that discussion, being willing and able to say, I'm not willing to go there. If that happens, I cannot go there for you. I'll go this far, I'll do this, I'll give you this gas or this much of my time. I, I'm willing to skip one or two stops or I'm willing to do... That's, a, a, in my opinion, a very insightful discussion to have before the dive. The risks you are willing to take. I personally find it very important to premeditate a lot of these scenarios and to say these words. If scenario X happens to you, I may not be able to follow you there and I need you to be okay with that or we cannot dive together or vice versa. If this happens to me, I accept that you will go this far and no further. I think that's a very, in, in, a, in a dramatic way, is a very beautiful part of technical diving that you actually have to talk through those real dangers and the possible solutions or the absence of solutions. So the real risk that you are both or all of you are accepting on a mission. Now, we already talked a little bit about decompression uh, and what no stop diving is versus decompression diving. And we already established that the deeper we go, the less no stop time we have. At a certain point, no stop time runs out. And part of what technical diving is, is venturing into decompression. So beyond that no stop limit and having a plan to dive your way 
out. Now this is by no means a finalized science. There is still a lot that we do not know about decompression theory. We know to an extent based on math and based on field studies what people can and cannot do, but there is a lot of gray area. A dive that may be perfectly survivable by one person may kill another person. And that gray area is why conservatism is so important. Now we use what we call a decompression algorithm, so a mathematical formula, to calculate our dive plan ahead of time and then our computers produce that algorithm again based on our actual position during the dive. Now, there are different algorithms that technical divers may choose to use. The two most common ones are the Variable Permeability Model Bubble, VPMB, or the Bullman uh, algorithm. Now, it's a bit of a debate <laughs> in some diving communities which one is preferred, uh, and I would say it's a personal choice. I'm definitely a Bullman diver. Bullman models tend to push you a little Little bit shallower early on and then really stretch those final stops. Um, I enjoy the idea that I'm a little bit closer to home, a little bit closer to the surface. Should something still go wrong beyond my control, I am a little bit closer to surface support. But again, there is really no finalized research on which algorithm is better or why you choose, should choose one over the other. But what I can say is that if you are an avid technical diver, you probably stick to one model and only ever tweak it slightly to see if it maybe has a, a positive effect on your dives. It gets really trippy when we calculate these dives because it can be very difficult to, on the fly, estimate the consequences of your actions. When we are at 100 meters, 330 feet, in some cases, a minute of bottom time can result into 10 minutes of decompression requirements. That means that for every six seconds of delay, there is a full minute getting tacked onto our uh, decompression time. That's important information because you may not be carrying the gas to complete that plan. The trippy part is that that feels a little bit like that movie Interstellar, where they are on one planet and every hour that passes on this planet is 30 years passes on Earth, something like that. Now, I still find it hard sometimes to wrap my mind around the fact that a dive to, for instance, 100 meters, 330 feet, depending on the exact uh, you know, details of your algorithm, one minute spent at depth results in 10 minutes of decompression time. Or in other words, a mere six second delay adds one minute to your decompression schedule. That also means that if you were to somehow, if you had the gas supply, you were somehow to get stuck for 45 minutes, you would now be six hours away from home. So it is very important to plan these dives and execute them to a T. Now becoming a technical diver is not for everyone. Maybe you learned something in this video, maybe you learned about dangers that are or aren't acceptable to you, and maybe you find the discipline just a little bit too much for a sport that you do for fun. That's fair game. Now, you may already be a technical diver, you may be a trimix diver, or you may be a closed circuit diver. Either way, this video just serves to offer a little bit of an insight into what technical diving is, but also to set a nice and clear barrier. If you're interested in technical diving, there are ways to pursue this avenue. But most training agencies will have a bit of stepping stones to take before you get there. And that is normal, that is very good. It's extremely important to take your time on your journey towards becoming a technical diver. A thorough understanding of physics and physiology of your equipment, but also proficiency with your buoyancy skills, for instance, is extremely important. That's it, that's a little bit of an insight into technical diving, the dangers, the benefits, and why I love it. If you like videos like this, please subscribe to the Saga channel, leave a comment if you have a question, we can also discuss that down below. You may also disagree with some things that I said, I'm always happy to engage and happy to learn from my mistakes as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.